I'm Chris Calfee. I'm the First Stage 1X IPT Manager. My name is Kevin Flynn. I'm from Marshall Space Flight Center. My role on Ares 1X is I'm the avionics um, IPT Manager. I'm David Gwaltney, and I was the Deputy Lead Systems Engineer for Avionics for um, Ares 1X. Uh, name is Mike Bangham. Um, I was the Deputy Lead Systems Engineer. Uh, while assigned here at Marshall, I actually was supporting the Langley team. Um, and, uh, and by the time we actually flew, I was the uh, Chief Engineer for the Systems uh, team, for the System Engineering team up there at Langley. The risk was, um, since we used tape on 1X to, um, for anti-chafing purposes on the harnesses, and this tape is conductive and ungrounded, that you can build up an ESD charge, which obviously can have an um, adverse effect on electronics. Uh, with respect to the use of, of aluminum or metal tape in, in the Aries 1X program, uh, back you know, a couple years ago when we started developing the engineering to process the hardware, we had requirements that we pulled out of the ICD. The ICD stated uh, for the use of a tape for chafing or thermal properties, uh, it listed a mill standard tape or equivalent. So in the development of the engineering um, and the development of the drawings that flowed out of the ICDs, our engineers from Lockheed Martin and uh, the first stage engineers from ATK were involved in lots of conversations on the development of those drawings. One of the conversations was discussing an equivalent for that mill spec standard tape called out by the ICD. That equivalent was proposed by ATK as the infamous aluminum tape. This aluminum tape is used throughout the SRB and has been for years. It's always been used there to wrap harnesses, primarily for thermal reasons, for insulation, for chafing, and for um, to protect the harnesses from sharp edges uh, that exist within the aft skirt or wherever the, the harnesses are used. So there was an agreement reached between the ATK engineers and the Lockheed Martin engineers on what this equivalent was at the time. So that drawing, the aluminum tape, uh, ended up in that drawing. It, uh, Lockheed Martin agreed to it at the time that that was an acceptable equivalent. Our contractor for the avionics was Jacobs Lockheed, and Lockheed's experience with Atlas um, drove us to an ICD requirement that said we should use tape that meets a mill spec that requires the tape be non-conductive, it be an insulator used for anti-chafing purposes. First Stage um, and their contractor, ATK, design experience is to use an aluminum-based tape which is conductive for the purpose of wrapping harnesses for anti-chafing. Um, the mill spec that we had for Areas 1X said that the tape to be used um, had to be non-conductive of an insulator type. ATK contacted a person in the MMP department at Lockheed Martin to ask, would this metallic tape be equivalent? And the person at Lockheed Martin answered um, in the affirmative. Uh, we used a, a process called the IPPD process, uh, essentially the concurrent engineering process, and we did that because of, of the schedule pressure. Uh, you know, the pressure that we're under to deliver hardware. So the process basically went like this. All the involved parties that had uh, an input or needed to review a drawing if it was, if they had hardware being installed on the drawing. These were essential, these were first stage drawings, assembly level drawings. Uh, they just happened to have avionics hardware that were installed on them. So the, the avionics members were invited to these reviews and the Lockheed Martin guys were the guys that participated uh, for the most part. Um, so those drawn, those drawn reviews were held thoroughly. Um, we we were, were confident that uh, we were getting the right level of review based on the comments and the level of comments we received from the Lockheed Martin guys. Uh, you know, the, the level of comments received were an indication that they were thoroughly reviewing these drawings. We don't believe that they missed the use of metallic tape in those drawings. So during drawing reviews, which were going very, very quickly because the, co the project was very fast-paced, the, the tape that showed up in the parts list wasn't specifically identified as aluminum tape. It was identified by the part number that ATK used and, you know, as, as a, a protective overwrap or a sheathing type tape. So nobody at the time who was doing the drawing reviews realized that it was, at least on the, you know, avionics side, realized that that was, um, you know, a conductive aluminum tape. It wasn't until the uh, harnesses were being installed 
um, in both in the RF, I think, and, and uh, well, it was in the RF and also in the VAB, but it, some pictures were being circulated around of the harness installations, and one of the EMI engineers at um, Lockheed Martin said, what's that silver stuff all over our harnesses? Uh, a lot of emotional uh, uh, exchanges back and forth. It really came down to uh, um, Lockheed Martin was not comfortable flying with tape. They had never done that before, and they, they just saw it as an unnecessary risk being exposed to them, where on, from the STS environment, we had, uh, we've been flowing it, flying like that for um, uh, 30 years without any detectable issue. You really had two cultures. Uh, one culture uh, from the uh, STS environment that always wrapped them with metallic tape and saw no issue with it because they had a lot of experience with it. You had another culture coming from the Lockheed Martin side, the Atlas V side, that had never wrapped them in and in fact pointed to our NASA standards that said you would not wrap anything that's exposed to um, an airflow environment in metallic surface without grounding it. I mean, they basically were pointing to our own specifications and, and standards that uh, uh, that we had already interpreted differently in the STS world um, and, and were doing business differently than we had integrated spacecraft. We did a lot of really good analyses to go back and look to see how much of the risk was really there. We brought in a lot of expertise. We brought in aerospace. Uh, we brought in expertise from Marshall uh, that weren't involved in the program that had a lot of insight into the physics, the fundamental physics, and we tried to characterize the risk. And um, we did some testing uh, down at the Cape to actually show how much charge could build up on it. Um, we largely convinced ourselves that uh, uh, on the NASA side that the uh, uh, that the, it really wasn't an issue. So once the once the issue was identified by Lockheed Martin as as an issue, as a concern that they had that there would be some type of charge during flight that might cause catastrophic failure, loose loss of the vehicle. Obviously, that's taken seriously. SNMA got involved. Uh, the engineers, chief engineers got involved and all this bubbled up through the SERFs and the ERBs and eventually the XCBs. Uh, different parties were brought in. Aerospace Corporation was brought in to review it. Marshall Engineering experts were brought in to take a look at it and provide an opinion. And all the parties concluded that uh, the risk was acceptable. Lockheed Martin uh, remained uh, steadfast in their position that uh, that they carried all the way to the flight te test readiness review you know, a few days, a couple weeks before flight. NASA took measures to determine whether or not the tape really would be equivalent and whether or not there would be an issue. Um, Lockheed didn't accept that um, decision or that rationale because they felt that the analysis was inconclusive and didn't have enough data to back it up. There was a lot of discussion about test data. Um, there was some test data that was uh, presented for um, installations in the orbiter that indicated that the um, you know what what the the level of um, the charge would have to be before it would discharge. It did not necessarily cover you know how the charging would occur. For some of the tests that were done to support that, they were charge was forced on a you know on a a segment of conductive material and then you know, to determine what potential it would rise to before it would discharge. There were other tests that were um, conducted in a lab using airflow. These were more informal tests that were conducted real time in some cases during the discussions. And measurements were made to try to determine if there was a charge buildup. And, um, and just in, lab, in a lab environment, they couldn't, they couldn't pr you know, produce a, a, a situation in which there would be a charge buildup just due to airflow. There were other discussions about um, tests that had been done where sand had been blown across the surface and there was a charge buildup. And we even had expert testimony discussing that, um, you know, he had uh, pictures of discharges from harnesses that were floating and not connected to anything else 
um, you know, in, in an electromagnetic environment, for instance. So the possibility, we knew the possibility existed. It seemed, you know, for areas where there weren't, there was not going to be any airflow that the risk was very low. And, and so that, that information was taken into account to make the decisions about, um, you know, where to leave the tape or where to say tape couldn't be, the aluminum tape couldn't be installed from the exterior parts in particular. We came to the determination, you know, based on some of this uh, testimony that there was the potential that there could be charge buildup, but that there would, might be ways to mitigate that or at least, you know, provide a um, reasonable, uh, a feeling that we were accepting a reasonable risk. So for some of the, in, there was a, we looked at the tape, the, the harnesses installa harness installations at various at the various locations in the solid rocket booster and try to determine, you know, what the level of risk was in those particular areas. Um, so for some of the areas which would be enclosed, completely closed during flight and sealed, such as the forward skirt extension, the um, fifth segment simulator, and the, um, well, and the forward skirt, it was determined that because those would be, essentially be a Faraday cage, that it was unlikely that uh, there would be, you know, an impingement of external radiation that could cause a charge buildup. Um, it was determined that for the areas that were enclosed and could be considered Faraday cages, those the the tape the harnesses could be installed with the aluminum tape. The existing harnesses would not be modified. There was some discussion about bonding the electrically bonding the harnesses as being a possible mitigator on the, the, the tape on the harnesses. But there was no real easy way or um, practical way to do that since the, sec the, it was, the tape sections were, you know, not conductive between each other. So um, they were just left, basically left alone. The install, uh, the, any installations that were done in the forward skirt extension or the, um, the fifth segment simulator or the, um, or the forward skirt were just allowed to be done with aluminum tape as is. For the aft skirt, as long as the tape was under, the taped harness segments were going to be under the foam and not exposed to the environment, um, that was deemed to be acceptable. For portions of the harness that were going to be exposed above, you know, the, or outside the foam, so another non-conductive tape had to be used for the protection. And then for all the installations in the external, on all new installations on the um, you know, that were external on the SRB or in the systems tunnel, could not use um, the aluminum tape. From from the first stage perspective, the biggest lesson learned that we got out of that is is how you write your requirements. I think what got us off into that was the language or equivalent in the ICD. It stated, use this tape or equivalent. Well, we went the equivalent path and determined, and, and at the time got everyone's agreement that this aluminum tape was an equivalent. I think you've also heard First Aid's um, comment that you want to, we want to avoid the words you know, or equivalent in an ICD, and I agree. I think that's too vague. I think uh, lessons learned is that in the ICD, you need to call out a mil spec, um, and if there's another potential way to meet that requirement, perhaps put some wording here that says the proposed solution has to be proposed ahead of time before being implemented, not just say or equivalent because that leaves a degree of vagueness that can get us into challenges. From my perspective, the biggest lesson learned on this is that um, especially when you have a situation like we had with Aries 1X where everything's moving fast, we have several entities coming together with their established practices, and it's been condoned by the the way the you know the project has been set up in terms of the requirements documents for the different entities to bring their own processes and proce heritage processes and procedures to bear on the you know, the implementation and the integration of the, pro of the vehicle, um, that when we have requirements documents, these requirements documents, number one, need to be um, flowed down to, from the higher levels to the people who are actually doing the work. One of the issues that we had was not everybody who was actually involved in 
implement, you know, in, in doing integration or creating drawings for installation was aware of all the, was, was even aware of the ICD for, in the first place and was aware of all the requirements in the ICD. So we need, in, in the first place, I think we need to have a, you know, a, a strong systems engineering and integration presence that ensures that the requirements are known at all the appropriate levels within the IPTs. Another lessons learned, I think, is that it's important to document the ICD clearly as to you know, what the interface truly is, but it's also important to be thinking about how those requirements will be verified before you actually get into the implementation of building the hardware. And the only, the only way to do that that I know of is, like, is, is to have all parties write the ICD as clearly as possible, but you also have to have SCNI involved during the manufacturing and buildup of the design to watch real time to see if the ICD is being followed and that if issues come up, they can be resolved quickly um, to figure out what to do about that conflict regarding what was, what was in the ICD and what's actually happening on the floor. That, inter that real time interaction to make sure the document's being followed is very important. One of the other lessons we, we got out of this process, which I alluded to a little bit before, is that as the design is being put together, I think it's very important to be giving thought to and documenting how each requirement is going to be verified. In this particular case, the requirement says use a tape of mil-spec XYZ or equivalent, and that mil-spec called out non-conductive insulating material. So the question was, is a conductive tape equivalent to that? Well, even though um, the contractor at Lockheed Martin said that, uh, that yes, it would be okay, that's not enough for a verification. And so I think one of the challenges here was that if it had been taken a little bit more time to determine how that requirement, how, that, how the equivalency would have been verified, it actually would have been shown that you can't verify it, that the two tapes are not equivalent. And so a waiver would have been required. And that, like I said earlier, would have gotten the discussion going much sooner than when the tape was actually being used on the floor. One of the lessons we got from this is that if a material is being proposed that is not in compliance with the ICD, because the ICD said mil-spec were equivalent, and the idea was by having a conversation between first stage and the MMP person at Lockheed Martin to determine whether or not the proposed metallic tape would be equivalent. One of the lessons learned was here was that that really is too informal. Um, in order to know whether or not you could, you could actually verify that the proposed material was equivalent, it's important that when it seems that there's going to be a deviation from the requirement that the issue be brought up to SCNI. Um, and then SCNI can get the right people around the table, have the full discussion, and vet it to make sure that it can indeed be verified and it's not just one person's opinion um, in an informal email conversation or email chain between two contractors. Another lesson learned here is this was really a communication um, situation. Both IPTs, avionics and first stage, had direction that we're to follow our legacy processes to the greatest extent possible. As I said, Atlas's experience is to wrap the harnesses with non-conductive tape for anti-chafing purposes, and that's what got put in the ICD. But Shuttle has been doing has been using conductive aluminum tape for, for many years, and so their heritage process calls for that tape. So lessons learned here is that when the two different um, procedures come together from two IPTs because of legacy hardware, you need to pay close attention to see if there isn't a conflict and try to work that out ahead of time. You know, it, it's, it's again, we're taking existing hardware off uh, an Atlas V or existing designs and applying it to uh, our mission that was essentially being integrated during uh, in a shuttle environment. Um, you're going to have disconnects. That's a given. I mean, because they, they do business different ways. You really were taking two um, uh, heritage programs and trying to melt them together. And, and anytime you try and melt them together, that interface is where you're going to have your issues. And, and, and you, you've got to pay more attention to um, where you're mirroring, there, where you're, where you're overlapping or, or pulling together uh, heritage processes from one program being used on hardware from another. And, and you just have to do the due diligence early on. I do, I do want to point out you know, the positive aspect of this experience as well um, showed that the dissenting process works. 
um, Lockheed Martin, once they realized the tape was being used um, on the floor, you know, pointed out that they had a dissenting opinion. They documented their dissenting opinion. It was heard by the 1X control board, the Constellation control board, and the vetting process went all the way up to the flight readiness review. And so I was very happy with the way the dissenting opinion process worked. It really got a chance to get everybody involved who needed to be involved in the conversation. And in the end, I think the government was able to make an informed decision.